Hello and welcome to Innovative Indies, the show where we chat to independent filmmakers who are innovating the film industry. In this episode, I'm chatting to Jason Brown. Jason talks about his experiences with one man banding a lot of his projects. We also get into distribution and good ways of going about it and who best to reach out for, for those of you in that kind of genre. Without further ado, let's chat with some Innovative Indies. In the film industry, how did you get to where you are today? Just self-taught. What I really like doing really is visual effects, but I'm also, I I like writing the screenplays as well. Just the passion to learn. I mean, one of my inspirations is Robert Rodriguez. Picked his book up when I was in my teens and um, Rebel Without a Crow. And he was basically just making a movie himself. And it, it kind of seeded from there to like just make, keep making movies someone through imdb a russian who was a cinematographer in los angeles and um, he's kind of mentored me a little bit and he he did the music videos for eminem britney spears uh, some of the biggest music videos you've seen and he he inspired me and you know told me taught me a lot about the industry and and i just carried on making micro budget feature films you know i start i started off with shorts but i think if you really want to learn how to make a movie is, is, is if you can try and dive into doing a feature film, it's tough. But what I do, obviously, if you've got no finance, I do it in stages. I do every time I can shoot, I'll shoot. So, and that's how I managed to complete a feature film. Even so, I mean, sometimes it can take nearly a year to, to do, but that's how I managed to get feature films finished. What would you say is the, the main difference between a short and a feature in terms of like the filmmaking side of it? Like, what is it that, you know, you say it's, it's harder, but but why is it harder? I think doing a feature film and doing a, a short film's quite different. You've just got a lot more to to do, you know, obviously we feature. And um, it's like when I when I went from short films to doing feature films, it, it felt like it was a completely different thing. You know, in a, in a way, it, it, was, it was just hard. Oh. So I'm learning something new now. I've not, you know, I've not done this before. But I suppose if you're doing a feature film and you've only done short films, if you treat treat the feature film like a bunch of short films, kind of like an anthology a little bit, but obviously just one set story, you will eventually get to the end of it and, and have a finished feature film. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I just finished wrapping up uh, my first feature, and it, uh, I was like, it's like doing five shorts. It's, it's just like it's just a long haul. But you're right in saying it, it. It it does feel like a whole different medium, even though it's film and all that. There's there's a certain pace to features that is so specific, which I've been learning on this project. But I'm sure you've had plenty of experience with that. With how many how many projects have you worked on now? Features. I think I've done about six short films, but these are two completed feature films that got released in the states and um, Dark Vale. David Ghost and I've got Morris comes out in October and I was lucky enough to get Tamara Glenn from Halloween that was in the Halloween five in that and she and she was in the 80s Miami Vice as well so she was that's the first time I've actually got a, a some sort of name in a in a feature film so um yeah it's uh, three feature films and I've got one in pre-production which is Creek Encounters. How would you say your process differs from the standard indie filmmaking process i think it's the fact that um where i live we've not really got uh, many crew members so i take a lot of the jobs on myself you you've probably done a similar sort of thing it's so yeah i'm a bit of a one-man band it's only recently with uh, doing new this uh, morris movie that people have started to come on board and help a little bit more the thing is i love all the process of making you know i love everything about it being the dp and you know editing it's just yeah our ed- editing is the most fun it's probably a one-man band thing where i'm just pretty much doing it all myself and that's how i'm getting these feature films finished and and distributed what would you say are the uh, the benefits and disadvantages of making films that way it's probably um just the help it would be it'd be nice to have the extra help to you know and obviously you you're going to be weaker at one thing than the other. So obviously you'd probably be stronger at your storytelling and your camera operating, but you'd probably be weaker at your sound. Uh, so that's that's the disadvantage that, you, you know, you, you're not good at. You know, I think with me doing the movies, I've tried to like slowly built up everything, like to get 
quite good at everything, you know. But I'm still not quite there. But obviously, because I'm like doing it, you know, like most independent filmmakers do it. They're kind of like a one man band. But it's just the problem is, is finding people. Everyone's got jobs, and you know, it's getting people to your location, and then people let you down. So you've got to operate the camera, and you've got to do this and that. Uh, and I'm, I've just got to a point where I'm, I'm used to just doing it myself, you know, just operating the camera, also doing the screenwriting and editing and visual effects. So it's just, you know, just done it myself, like self-taught. Um, it's only recently that I've had Steve and, and Adams uh, that's in my movie. Uh, Morris, he he's, knows quite a few people on independent film scene and he's got them involved as well, which has helped a lot. So. Whenever I do talks, I always say... Like try and learn everything, not necessarily so that you do everything all the time, but if someone drops yeah. out, you can just step in and do it. Can happen a lot. So I think that's quite a wise sort of approach to to the whole thing. When you're definitely when you're starting, like make the effort to learn every process so that you can in those times of desperation just step in and be like, Yeah, I've got this. <laughs> so I think you're definitely doing the right thing. Do you say that you you kind of work a lot? with actors and crew being crew and sometimes they're actors but very much one man banding it you've only really mentioned like the negatives of like you need more help but i'm sure there's some benefits to it the way that you oh, yeah. that you do yeah i think i think if you've got a passion and drive for it and you love writing um that's the thing with me i love every aspect of filmmaking you know lighting um you know i, I love it all so it's it's not like a, a such a chore to get behind the camera and do everything and do the editing and that. I, I actually enjoy it, but obviously you get people involved with you and say, oh, I feel like you're doing too much on this. You know, you're doing so much. It's a full length feature film and you, you're doing the visual effects, you're doing this, you're doing that. Don't you want me to try and bring someone in to give you a little bit of help? I'm like, well, yeah, that's cool, you know. Um, and I've only just started realising that with this third feature that, that maybe, yeah, sometimes it's, it's nice to take on that little bit, a little bit, a bit of help, even if you are passionate about every aspect of uh, doing the film, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to up your quality if, you, if you've got these extra hands. I mean, it, usually it's just, I'm using friends and family to do makeup and, and old lights and even the crew, you know, sorry, even the cast, you know, just to carry the lights, moving, moving the tripods from one place to another. If you got a studio movie, it'd be a luxury, wouldn't it? For someone like me and you, it'd be like, oh, this is amazing. You know, <laughs> I've got a focus puller. <laughs> I don't have to do focus, someone does it for me. What we found in some of our projects is it, it does create a very community-based project. And I think that is an incredibly awesome thing to have. Like you say, it was all your all your projects that you've worked on have been really enjoyable overall for everyone on the set. And it's like you, you do have to be be careful with 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 it in the sense that you need to make sure that you are working with the right people when you are doing something so uh in so independent. You know, you, you need to make sure you've got the right people on that set, ones that will enjoy that yeah. whole process. They don't mind being a little bit of crew sometimes, uh, providing they get to act. And you just kind of need the right the yeah. right mentality of people to be like, they're going to put their hand in and do what they can to get it done. Well, do you find that obviously when you're doing, doing your feature, you need everyone to be giving 110%? Because obviously if one part of something don't work, then it's kind of affects the rest of the film. So obviously with Morris, we were lucky with that because everyone were given 110% on, on it. And um, if they don't, it kind of, like I say before, it kind of like, it can fail in a little bit of, the film can fail on just a little bit of a, of a scene, you know, that you, you're trying to do. I feel on Morris, we, we got like, we had an 110% on it, but obviously some of my earlier movies, you know, they were like, oh, I don't really want to be here, blah, blah, blah. It's almost like you need the, the the backlog of evidence that you can do the film so people to have all that real confidence in you. And I think that is also another thing that those filmmakers starting out, uh, you've got to be mindful of is if, if you don't have that evidence of previous work, um, it's, it's going to be a lot harder for the people working on your set to feel comfortable working with you because they don't know what they're going to get in the end. And it's like, you, you just got to be very, very kind on those more so than ever on those first few and then when they yeah. can see that they get a result i actually acted in the first movie first feature that i did a day ago so i actually acted in that myself because i just couldn't find anyone to do it no one wanted to do it and then obviously when it got released oh, oh he's getting his movies released so it helped get other people for the next film and then it just trailed on to the next film because you could see it 
it was on sale in like Best Buy and Walmart and places like that. So, so yeah, it kind of, like, like you say, you know, once someone sees results, they're kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get involved with you. You say that as you complete each project, you then send over your finished cut to distributors you know. Do you find yourself having to alter your films when you get a distributor involved later down the line? The only thing that's changed with the movies is titles. Like Morris is, is not called Morris on release. It's going to be in, a, in the UK. It's being called The Haunting of Morris. And the America version on it is going to be called Ghost Track. So they've changed the name, but obviously they're doing that for sales. One of the distributors, like Morris sounds too generic. So, you know, it could be a movie about a dog called Morris. Is it, you know, is it is an horror movie? So he says it sounds too generic. So we want to change the title. So obviously there's that negotiation with the title, but that's the only time they've ever changed, asked me to change the title. They liked Dark Veil and they liked Today with Ghosts. So. So yeah, that's the only thing that's ever been changed on my releases. That's that's great to hear, actually, that they can kind of like give you that much breath with your creative piece. That's really good. It's usually posters as well, isn't it? It's the other one. Oh, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, the posters as well. Um, but I do have an influence of what I want. But, I mean, the distribution will turn around and say, oh, well, ultimately it's our decision what poster is going to be, but you can, you know, you can have your say. So I've, I've uh, sent some images of what, I think the poster should be um, the the one the one that I was really impressed with the Dark Veil the one that they did the cover for. Mm-hmm. I mean, they pay people to do these professional cover covers. It's same as they'll recut the trailer as well. Um, you'll see when it gets close, they'll 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 recut the trailer. But someone's getting paid to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, the trailer and the poster and the artwork. I mean, sometimes you'll get as well. Obviously, on the level I'm on, it, it's, it's just micro budget movies is. Um, they'll change the, t- the the cover. This has not really happened with me. The covers have pretty much stayed close to the film, but some people get covers that are completely different to what the actual movie is, which is it's kind of, if you're an independent filmmaker, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. You know, it's like, well, I, I don't like this cover. You, know, you can argue with them as much as you want, but ultimately they, they'll say, well, we're releasing the movie, so this is the cover we're going to use. There's been some amazing examples of like bizarre examples when someone's got a very kind of drama driven piece and then they just they just make the poster look action. Like, oh, it's an action film. And then people watch it yeah. and they go, oh, it's not action, rubbish, one star. And it's yeah, very it's much a, like it was never meant yeah. for them. It was never meant for them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is, it is odd that. And I, I do, I mean, maybe like some younger indie filmmakers don't know that distributors do that uh, and it does happen so you've got to like when you're doing your contracts yeah. you can say well do i ever say in this the way that you're going to market it who are you going to market it towards and also having that um that preemptiveness to know whether your distributor is going to be right for your film like what other kind of films do they do they distribute is it similar to yours or do they just do very specific genres if you come at them with a drama piece and they only distribute horrors well, they're going to make your drama piece look like a horror and then try and sell that. So, Actually, yeah. Your new feature is an horror then. The one you've you've just completed is an horror film, a such, or a thriller. It's a fantasy with horror elements. Oh, yeah, so it's about werewolves, but it's about the folklore of werewolves. So, oh, yeah. So so obviously you'd, you'd probably still be adding towards people that mainly release like horror move uh, horror distribution companies you know as such uh, tips for like young filmmakers you know releasing the movie uh, they, they do get a distribution company that's interested in their film um just be careful who, who you release with because obviously there's a lot of distribution companies will just slap it out in a month and then you know they'll just put it straight up onto a streaming platform and completely change your cover. You've just got to be careful when you get to that level and, like say, have your say, you know, and make sure, do your research on the distribution company first because I've known a couple of people that have been stung in the past, you know. I mean, we, we with the horror movies, we go with Wild Eye and obviously they release some low-budget stuff, but um, it is a distribution company that doesn't get it into the mainstream and, and doesn't get it on the shelves and, you know, they'll advertise um, in Dread Central and places like that you know, that's going to really push your film because they've got a lot of followers, you know. So, so yeah, you just do research before you, you know, release. And we've got a name as such in this one as well. So this is the fir- this is new territory for me. So I don't know how, how much this is going to help 
uh, with Tamara in it. You know, obviously she's attached to Halloween, so it's you know it's a massive franchise, um, and she's obviously um, done done a lot more than any of us have. She's been involved in studio films, so so I just don't know what how that's going to play out because she's got a fan base. You know, I mean, for a living mainly, she goes to conventions and signs autographs and posters and stuff for people. So so we'll have to see. So what? You know what that how that works out, you know, because that's just new territory for me to have an actual some sort of name in the film. Um, so yeah, it's just you know, I mean, a lot of people from what obviously now you've got a name, a lot of people say, Oh, I'd try and get some sort of name in your movie that's been in a, a big film, even if it's a washed up name, just try and get someone in there that's you know, it doesn't necessarily always work out that way, though. You know, like I say, uh, we've been rejected from a few big film festivals, even with the name in it. So, yeah, it's just it's just look at draw sometimes, you know, sometimes you're in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I think, um, a lot of people say that the main the main place where the name matters is in those sales, and you just got to just plaster the face on the posters, on the DVD boxes, yeah. on the thumbnails, everywhere, and then people go, ooh. Well, I already click. know Tamara's going to be on, the, her name will be on, the, even though she's not a main character as such, she's in film for five to ten minutes, but obviously her name will be on on the thing because it's it's the selling point as such, because that's the only person really that's known as such in, in the film. It's just tricky when you're at such a low-budget level. From my experience as well, I don't think talent's enough with it. You know, it's... You know, you've got to kind of know people in the industry as well. It's it's just tricky. I mean, as a filmmaker, what is your ultimate goal? What do you want to do? Do you do you want to get into? Do you want to become a, a professional studio filmmaker, like someone that gets hired by the studios? Because that's always been my dream. That's one of my things. Even though it's a bit of a rougher end, you know, you don't get a final say, cut on final say, and stuff. You know, a lot of studio movies basically just come in after you've filmed it and take over. You know. As much as a dream that is, that is what I want to do. I want to get into big movies, you know. It's always been my thing. But, you know, you just got to keep doing it. I mean, is that what you, is that, is that your feelings? Or you just you want to make great independent films? Mine is different, actually. I, I just want to, like, work on, like, fairly small budgets. I don't want massive, but just enough to be able to reasonably pay people um and, and and just pay for their living like because i've been gradually cultivating uh, a, a production team who keep coming back for the same projects and just being able to basically pay for their living whilst we just keep making cool stuff uh yeah. <laughs> that's like the nice yeah, that's, kind of... that's where you get that opportunity comes along when you make something cool and someone comes out oh i really like this we want you to do a, another movie for a bigger budget you know mm. um i think i think I think there's a few directors that tread in the studio stuff, but they also stay independent as well, which is uh, Danny Boyle does that, doesn't he? Kind of, he does the studio stuff, but obviously stays in, with his independent roots as well. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. Like, I think a lot of young filmmakers, they just go, ah, big. It's like, you don't need to always focus on big. You can, you know, you can set your goals where you want, but I think you're right in saying it's important to at least think about it. Um, where you know why are you doing this? Where, do you, where are you trying to get to? Uh, I think exactly. Very... Yeah, have you got a goal, an ultimate goal of what you you know what you want to achieve? But that's that that is for me. That's you know, I mean, I've been doing it a long time now. It's over ten years making films. Um, obviously, feature films set two, but mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it's it's been a long time. I've been doing it a long time. With your feature films, do you approach distributors before you make them or only afterwards? It's afterwards. I just make the movie and then I send it to to them and say, "Oh, what, what do you what do you think to this?" And it says, "Yeah, I'll release it." Which is with with Morris, we've never had. We've got two distributors on this one, which is um, Left Films, Ellen Grace, and obviously Robert Wildeye. So the two two separate distribution companies this time. And this is a first for me as well to have two people releasing your film. You know, two separate distributions. So how do you find? your distributors uh, or, or how do you find ones that you can feel confident in in taking your film you'll you'll find a lot of them will just have if uh, if you go to the web pages a lot of them will, will just have like if, if you're interested as a distribution you movie, please send us a, a screener link well actually with um with my first feature actually someone from los angeles um james cullen brazic who's a, a young filmmaker he basically saw a trailer for my first feature and he said that 
I've helped people get distribution before. Do you want me to help someone take a look at your work? And I says, oh, yeah, that'd be brilliant. So I sent the screener to Rob and then kind of got a relationship from there. So that's someone I can just take a movie to and say, there's a film. And I, I have helped other filmmakers in the past where they says, oh, can you can you put me in touch with Rob? And I says, yeah, I'll send him over to you. But I've told him there's no guarantee that I can help. That he, he might say, no, I'm not interested at this moment in time. But I can obviously show it him and say, oh, are you interested in releasing this film for this person? That, that happened with someone helping me. But uh, you'll find a lot of distribution companies will have that on the thing, uh, send us a screener. I know um, Left Films, Helen Grace, she'll take a look at your movies as well. She's doing the UK release. But they, they, were, they did, I don't know if you remember, but they did as a, a 20 pound zombie movie called Colin. Did you ever hear about that? Where they made this the zombie movie, it was like just really low budget and it, it blew up, you know. I think the fact that it, they were saying, oh, it was made for £20 like, helped, helped that movie um, sell because everyone wanted to see what a £20 movie looked like, a feature film. They were like, £20? You can't make a film for £20. So obviously everyone were like, looking at it like, oh, it's a £20 film. So that helped with selling the movie because everyone were intrigued by wanting to see, well, what's a £20 movie look like? But yeah, Ellen released that movie. So I was quite flattered because I remember that blowing up and seeing, getting by and going to an HMV and buying a copy of the film. So yeah, a lot of, you just got to Google distribution companies in UK. Obviously you your research and a lot on them will take a look at your movie, you know. But don't be disheartened if someone says no, hey, I'm sorry, unfortunately it's not for us at this time because there will be, I've had that before, but then someone else has released this bit higher up so absolutely it's, it's it's like you said earlier it is all the timing it so. depends what they've got on this on their slate as well mm. if they've took in 10 movies for that half a year oh sorry we're full we can't take any more movies on we're not going to release any more movies whether your movie's good or i mean i've had one people said come back to me the following year and then release like that you know and i suppose that's the other thing there's like two points i kind of want to bounce off of what you said was um yes it like that that 20 pound movie uh, is a rare case where it's like the saying that it's low budget is impressive but you also have to be very careful because uh, I and many others have made this mistake in saying you shouldn't be loud about that you've made something for cheap because that actually makes it so much harder to sell on most cases and people yeah. to actually watch in the first place as well uh, so keep that quiet and uh just yeah. put it out instead. And and my the top tip I got from a, a, another distributor was he said, if someone asks you how much you made it for, and it's on a small budget, you just say you made it for less than three million dollars. <laughs> you leave yeah, it at that. It. Yeah, um, it's true. true. Definitely, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, push it. That's as I mean, I had a few reviewers. Oh, they made this for two k. It was a miracle he did it for two k. But it's kind of like it's like, oh, I wish you'd have cut that on the low level, you know. <laughs> But it's just one of the things I, I try and not tell people how much I, and the thing of trying to make things look more expensive than they actually are. You know, it can be done. You can make some things look more costly. One of the things, one of the tips to doing that is film ex, in expensive looking places, buildings that look expensive, museums. They did it in Layer Cake with Daniel Craig. You know, they didn't have a big budget, but the shot in places that were like gold pillars and stuff like that, it makes your film look more expensive. That's great advice. Really good advice. There. But we did it. We did it in Dark Vale. We we shot in a in New Sadabi. You can Google it. Yeah, explore your local surroundings and find places that just make you go, "Wow, this is creepy," or "This is this is awesome looking." And That's on there. That's shoot on there. there. If there was one piece of filmmaking advice you could give the younger you, what would it be? Probably not cast myself. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, um, not cast myself. Um, probably have a, a little bit more patience, you know, and do more drafts on the script instead of doing just one and then film it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's another big thing as well. Like, you don't need to be in a rush when you're doing a film like there's you can finish a film and then it gets released two three years later that's that's common that's not yeah. you know it's not like oh you finished it it'll be up in a month what is next for you and where can people find you we're doing another feature film meant to start filming july august time creaking carters and we have tomorrow back for that and we also have kansas bowling that was in once upon a time in hollywood 
Quentin Tarantino's film. She plays one of the characters at the ranch, uh, one of the um, Manson family members. But yeah, that's kind of our next next film. We just obviously, we, we did an Indiegogo, but we only raised about £3,000, over 3000 So obviously we're looking at steps to get just a little bit more investment before we start filming. But the plan is to start July, August time. So that's the next next project. So, and uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, you know, look for Jason, look, type in Morris or Creaking Cutters. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe. If you are an indie filmmaker who is innovating the film industry, send me a message on social media at Seb Cox Films on Instagram or Twitter. If you want to check out my work, you can go to sebcox.com. But for now, I'll see you next time.